For thousands of years, the central narrative which has guided human behavior was the belief that our world rests at the center of a cosmos designed specifically for our human story to unfold. At the dawn of the Copernican Revolution, this worldview came crashing down to Earth, and we now struggle to find meaning in a world that no longer explains itself. Before these discoveries of our scientific age, it was the stories we told that guided us, provided a reason for why we are here, where we came from, and what happens once we are gone. It is often thought that a culture's mythology indicates the striving and self-examination of that culture. What do the stories we tell today say about who we are, how we see the world, and how we view our place in the cosmos? What does it say about the drastic change of our worldview in the last 100 years, when our most popular and perhaps only myth we have left is the myth that has become the most enduring, expressive, and consummate metaphor for our current crisis in meaning? The myth that stands for every conceivable human failing. The myth of the zombie. Tragedy was one of the most noble art forms of ancient Greece. It was common for the suffering of characters like Oedipus to be preordained by fate, fate that even the gods were incapable of altering. One of the key themes of stories like the Oedipus cycle was his redemption, that all his suffering was not in vain, that it had purpose and meaning. Tragedy dignifies the events of suffering by giving them significance. The zombie apocalypse is the anti-tragedy. It immerses us in a story and denies us closure. Most zombie stories in the same way. That is, if they end it all, the camera ambiguously fades away as we realize that there is no redemption for the survivors. No silver bullet, no stake in the heart, no action the protagonist can take which will lead to the salvation of their world. Most cultural interpretations of the zombie begin with the premise that in some pivotal way, zombies are us. They are the fictionally distorted, self-reflected version of modern man. Zombies do represent us, but more specifically, they represent the deterioration of our uniquely human ability to make and sustain meaning in our lives. Monsters are not a new phenomenon. Though their names and faces have changed throughout time, they all seem to stand to some degree for the dark and instinctual drives of human nature. The most pervasive and consistent monster of the 20th century was the alien, a perfect representation of our 20th century fear of the foreigner. At the height of our conflict with the Soviet Union, extinction by a foreign invader was at the forefront of everyone's mind, and it became one of the most enduring trends in pop culture. Many things have changed in our post-Cold War era. A new monster has emerged. A monster with traits never seen before. They aren't mute or reticent. They simply have no language. They don't transmit gists of conversation. They do the opposite. They communicate their incommunicability. The most common reason we refer to someone as a zombie is that he doesn't seem fully conscious. He is not aware of himself. He does not notice the world go by. The spoken word, the ability to think, strive, and yearn is what makes us human. Clear and distinct intellectual perception is what stands at the center of the mind's ability to recognize and reflect back on itself. This is the individual's awareness of himself his existence, his capacity to think, and therefore, to be. The lack of an interior reality means that the zombie cannot connect to the world. It cannot affirm its own realness, and it cannot affirm the realness of its environment. Zombies do not have lairs, nests, coffins, castles, or caves. They do not retreat anywhere as the sun breaks the horizon. Zombies drift. There is nothing whatsoever about a zombie that appears to belong to this world. There is a crucial difference between a house and a home. A house is simply a structure we inhabit. A home is transforming that structure into a place where we truly feel like we belong. At a greater level, the culture we live in is meant to provide that sense of home, of belonging to a place and to a people. This is why it can be deeply distressing to experience something like culture shock. Losing that feeling of at-homeness undermines the way we make sense of the world. While it is beneficial to travel and learn about new cultures and new ways of life, when this sense of loss happens within our own society, when we are culture-shocked within our own culture, suddenly there is no place for us to retreat. We cannot return home because there's no home to return to. 
That sense of connectedness with our environment is lost. Alienation, depression, and anxiety soon follow. It is not so much a sense of fear, but of horror. Like the feeling one would have if they were experiencing a slow and inescapable descent into madness. What better way to capture that feeling than with a monster that is constantly decaying, but never dies? Walkers, flesh eaters, dead, undead. To name something is to accept and become aware of it. In stories of vampires, werewolves, or monsters of every kind, as soon as you come to grips with what you are facing, you can fight it. Naming the monster is what guides the actions of the protagonist. To name the zombie brings no empowerment, just despair. Killing a zombie does nothing to solve the larger conflict that you are facing. Even in the few exceptions where the survivors do call the zombie by name, it is done in a way that simply re-emphasizes the hopelessness of their situation. Their name is not spoken with awe or reverence, because there is nothing supernatural about a zombie. They have no numinous or magical quality, no mysterious backstory surrounding them. That is what makes the zombie a monster of nihilism. They appear for no reason, as a seemingly self-evident and inevitable consequence of our modern sensibilities. If the world we live in is fundamentally without meaning, why would the end of that world need to explain itself? Instead of the process of assimilating food for energy, the zombie is insatiable. Zombies lack the properties of mind we think fundamentally human, yet they want to acquire mind in the most literal sense. The brain is a symbol for intelligibility. The devouring of the brain indicates the devouring of that intelligibility and all it affords. The fact that the brain is driving the consumption of brain is a deeply complex symbolic occurrence. Culture is devouring culture. Mind is devouring mind. Humanness is devouring humanness. This tells us that the zombie is not an external threat, but an internal one. The zombie craves with such singularity of purpose that this craving becomes its nature. It will feed itself for as long as it is able, but it does not incorporate or gain nourishment from anything that it consumes. It is constantly filling, but never gets full. What does our modern world desire to consume more than anything else? Information and connectivity. We feel that by devouring each other's minds, we can somehow regain that sense of connectedness to the people around us. But it never works. We never gain nourishment and our craving never subsides. As brain is eating brain, the instrument we use to make meaning in the world is devouring itself. They gather in incredibly large numbers, but these gatherings have no aim and no purpose. There is no history between any of them. There is no structure, no culture, and no cooperation or organization of any kind. They are surrounded by each other, but somehow remain in total isolation, lacking the ability to reach out to one another. To feel alone in a crowd full of people is a very modern problem. We have always been surrounded by strangers, but they have never been as strange as they are now. We must be able to interact with something in order to understand it. An objective, factual understanding of something is not the same as an intimate and deeply personal knowing. We feel and interact with the world around us by touching the world around us. The world in turn touches us, makes us feel that we are a part of it. The zombie has a cold, purely objective interaction with the world. It no longer feels. It has one purpose and anything else is relegated to meaninglessness. When a person's grasp of reality is slipping, we say that they are losing touch because touch is how we make sense of the world, the objects we have handled, the emotions we have felt, the intimate relationships we have held. These are the things we take to be most real. The zombie represents a crisis of intimacy. Every person is a zombie in waiting. Its contact with the world spreads its condition like a plague. The more we encounter the unfeeling mass, the more we become the unfeeling mass. Our modern world discourages contact in all its forms, and treating everyone like a stranger is the only way to avoid infection. We are surrounded and yet stranded, inundated, while utterly alone.
in cities all around the world, a strange sort of ritual enactment is taking place. Zombie walks represent a form of mystical participation, a return to primitive psychology, in which we find no trace of the concept of individuality. Instead, we find a collective relationship, which French ethnologist Levi Brol called participation mystique. It is described as a psychological connection in which the subject cannot clearly distinguish himself from an external situation or object. They form a partial identity, which the individual is bound to. Very similar to what we call mob mentality. At one of these zombie walks, there was an emergency situation and a doctor was trying to get help from one of the participants, but that person would only respond as a zombie. The doctor is trying to get them to realize that this is the real world and this person needs help, but they refuse to break character. Their commitment to the role reached a point of possession. We tell ourselves that we are the walking dead. 